The time has come for the Frostlass PvP IV Deep Dive. After saying I'd do it for like two months, I've finally done it. So in this video, I'm going to cover the important stat checks for Frostlass in Great League PvP and provide some tables highlighting the IVs that will get you those stats to make things nice and easy. If you've never seen a PvP IV Deep Dive before and you're kind of confused by what I'm talking about, breakpoints, specific IVs, what, uh, we'll link up above in the description to my PvP IVs simplified video. Uh, basically, you know, getting your feet wet with this content before diving off into the deep end here. And if you want to reference any of the information in this video in a text-based format, a uh, link down below to my article on GamePress, the Frostlast PvP IV Deep Dive, covering all the information in this video and more in a text-based format. Without further ado, let's talk about Frostlass. And if you're wondering about the, the swag wall here, um, I do have better adhesive now. I just haven't had the time to uh, remount all the panels. But that one panel behind me, is the only panel that remains. When it comes to Great League PvP, Frostlass is a really tricky Pokemon to like figure the IVs out for because it has two goals and the two goals really conflict with each other. Goal number one is getting charge move priority, not just in the mirror matchup, but in other important matchups too. If you checked out my uh, Venusaur or my Sableye PvP IV deep dives, you'd know that they have a similar attack stat to the Frostlass. And if I had done a Swampert PvP IV deep dive, I have an infographic, but I haven't done a video yet on it, uh, also falls into that attack range. So making sure you get CMP on them kind of a big deal. And as you know, with Frostlass heavy metas, especially the cup metas, Frostlass is kind of everywhere. So getting that CMP, it, it can be tough, right? It can be pretty tough for Frostlass. The other goal though, is a little bit more straightforward, which is having enough bulk to get all them sweet, delicious one HP wins. Getting the one HP wins are nice, but you can never really like nail down how much bulk is just enough to get it. So you try to go for as much bulk as possible. But if you do that, well, now you're going to be losing out on the charge move priority. So what is the most bespoke, perfect Frostlass that can get the best of both worlds? Well, I figured it out for y'all. Here is a PvP IV table featuring the most bespoke Frostlass for meeting Frostlass's bulk goals and getting as much attack as possible. If you want to link to this table and other tables I'm featuring in this video, they're in the article on GamePress, which is linked in the description. So what's going on here? Well, when it comes to the bulk goals, we're cutting this off at about 113 defense, and that's a reasonable number for Sableye. You don't want Sableye getting an attack breakpoint on you. If you're truly concerned about Sableye getting an attack breakpoint on you, you could go for like 114, um, but as low as like 112 should cover most Sableye. I think the rank one Sableye is like looking at 111 or something like that. Um, but 113, I'd say we're, we're keeping it pretty safe against most random Sableye that you can run into, right? Now, if you're wondering what matchup this is relevant for, um, it's, it's kind of hard to say because it's Frostlass, right? Frostlass is a, you know, safe swap, pivot kind of Pokemon, a counter swap, a closer. It's, it's going in and out of battles, right? And same can be said for Sableye. The main idea, though, is trying to get your Frostlass in a position where it can reach a charge move instead of just getting fully farmed down by the Sableye. Because if you can throw a charge move, you can get a shield or just KO it. And if they know that you can reach a charge move instead of getting full farm down, well, then you're going to cause that Sableye to spend some energy energy. So it's just kind of making the situation a little bit better for the Frostlass. Like you're potentiating the ability for Frostlass to do good things when it's pitted against the uh, the Sableye there. And then as far as expediting the farm down goes, which is another kind of strategy, you know, purposely have the lower defense miss the breakpoint so they don't get as much farm on you. Uh, Sableye's probably only get one extra fast move of farm in that situation, which can be important, but making Sableye spend a shield or throw energy or just KOing it instead, I think would be more impactful in more situations, right? So just having at least 113 defense can go a long way. Incidentally, this defense also covers some Mandy Buzz breakpoints, but it's kind of hard to say for sure because are people trading to improve their Mandy Buzzes? Uh, the defense breakpoint could go up to like 115, I think, when it comes to uh, some like egg hatch Mandy buzzes, so it's a little bit more fickle there. And then I guess if you are pumping the defense even lower than this, at least try to stay above like 110.8. Like uh, that's Diggersby. Um, you're definitely limiting your options to clown on Diggersby. Those fire punches, you know, they hurt a lot more when the mud shots are hitting you for one extra damage. So I think 113 defense 
is a safe general recommendation. Then when it comes to the HP, I have this cut at 131 HP. Uh, just looking at all the different kind of situations Frostlax can find itself in, you know, a head on energy, behind on energy, a head on shields, behind on shields, prior damage on you, prior damage on your opponent. You know, the more realistic situations that I've seen and do see happening for Frostlass, I was noticing 131 HP in reference to the, you know, the 113 defense was most consistent, right? It was consistent enough where if you were chasing a little bit of CMP that you'd be perfectly safe with that. That said, having a little bit more HP can be a little bit safer for the Frostlass. I go over some of the specific situations in the article linked below, um, but I think at the end of the day when it comes to Frostlass, if you've ever used a Frostlass or lost to a Frostlass that hung on by one HP, I think you could, you could theorize how having a little bit more extra HP could be kind of helpful. And I'd say with that overall, uh, the rank eight is looking like the most cozy frost last of the bunch for the ones highlighted in this deep dive. Then when it comes to the attack, there's no real specific goalposts here. I do have the list cut at 121.6, and that's just based on the like attack ranges that I'm going to expect from like a Venusaur, a Sableye, and a Swampert from all the previous PvP IV deep dive work I've done with those species. So I'd say this one helps you stay a cut ahead. Of course, you might not have any of those nine specific frost lasses here, but you do have higher attack than the rank one. And at the end of the day, the rank one is still pretty valid because it does have that good bulk. Um, so here I have an expanded list, which is basically the same defense and HP parameters as before, um, but with the attack cut off here. So yeah, I'd say these 21 are probably, you know, the most solid general all around frost lasses to be keeping your eyes peeled for here. The previous nine, which are also featured in here, just have even more CMP potential in my opinion. And uh, this list is cut at 18. Uh, there are more options than this. I just uh, cut the list at those 18 because I felt that they had, uh, you know, more advantages than the other ones. If I was going to be recommending like a super high strung frost last, I'd go with that. But you can expand this list to see more options. So it's like, hey, Ryan, I checked my IVs and, you know, I got the defense. I got the HP. I got this attack. You know, why is it cut off? And it's like, well, the ones above are a bit better. But of course, we don't have every single IV spread at our disposal. So if you want to see some more options, you know, just change this number at the top here. Additionally, you may notice that like the rank six and seven is getting skipped here because they've got lower HP. Does that mean that they're complete dog shit? And well, probably, right? No, I'm kidding. Uh, they're probably fine. Their higher defense probably makes up for it well enough where they have a 131-ish performance. But due to the restrictions with making these kind of tables, they would get cut out. Personally, though, after going through all this frost last stuff, I would favor the higher HP ones. Um, but don't panic if you have the rank six or seven or something like that. Now, no PvP IV deep dive would be complete without going into higher attack weighted stuff, right? And here we are still maintaining that 113 defense, uh, but we are dropping the HP to 127 in favor of bringing our attack weight even higher. So here we got 67 different options that meet these conditions. The attack weight here is cut at 123.12, which is an Altaria breakpoint. It potentiates the Altaria breakpoint against like Trev slaying Altaria. If you want to have it against the rank one Altaria, then you'll probably have to go with some of the higher attack weights on this list here. And it's just to help you farm it down, you know, clip it from reaching a charge move in some specific kind of situations, which can be helpful. It's not the biggest deal in the world, but I figured rather than having a table of like hundreds of options that just have lower HP, I may as well try to ground the attack around something, right? So that's what I went with. When it comes to the 127 HP, it's uh, to help maintain a variety of matchups, including but not limited to the Azumarill 1-1 shield scenario, the Toxapex 2-2 shield scenario, the Powdered Snow Alola Ninetales 0-0 shield scenario, and uh, possibly the Lickitung 0-0 shield scenario. IVs depending a bit. Um, this is kind of accounting for the fact that you have a higher attack weight, so you could KO it before it looks you down kind of thing, where like a lower attack weighted Frostlast needs a bit more HP in order to maintain that matchup, which is what like the 131 is kind of based around. So it's a little bit tricky, right? But I was just noticing that 127 was kind of pulling 
the chops here. Now, of course, you don't have to be confined by the parameters I set for you. Frostlass is a really tricky Pokemon, and going for an even higher attack weight, pushing your defenses or your HP even lower based on a meta that you're facing to get those CMP and possibly breakpoint advantages can be helpful. I did notice that if you're st if you start to push like a 128 attack stat, then you could get a breakpoint on Sableye, which could flip the 1-1 shield scenario. Now, they most definitely likely will be getting the breakpoint on you at that point, right? But when it comes to that specific even kind of situation, you can KO them on the Avalanche now, so it could make things a bit better for the Frostlass in that respect. And then additionally, for the Azumarill 0-0 shield scenario, you get a charge move breakpoint that allows you to flip that matchup instead of lose it if you have this wackier higher attack. When it comes to dropping your defense and your HP for that, like if you're hanging on to like, you know, greater than 110 defense for the Diggersby matchup, then you could get away with as low as I think 123 HP to kind of just hang on to whatever you can, white knuckled, right? Um, but if you do drop your defense a little bit lower, you're not expecting any Diggersby, then I think you can go as low as like 107.8 like defense. And you want that for Dunsparce and Spark Lantern to get the 2 1 shield scenario against them. Um, but Either way, with that higher defense, you're going to want higher HP, so so you can do other things. It's It gets weird. I'm just saying it gets weird. It's not something I can really like link or recommend because it gets to be so hyper-specific and so touchy that I feel like you, you kind of have to know exactly what you want out of Frostlass and what you're willing to like give up if you're going to go down that rabbit hole. It starts to get very wacky customizable and that's even without considering like you know prior energy prior damage having an energy lead being behind on energy so yeah color out of the lines here at your own risk is all i'm saying now all this wacky iv stuff is great ryan but what are the champions using you know the players that actually make day two the players that actually qualify for worlds and everybody i talk to that has made day two or qualified for worlds has used a Frostlass that has a higher attack weight than the rank one and has enough bulk where it falls into the bulk list that I have in this video. You know, the 113 defense, 131 HP minimum, every single one. Now, normally I share who these competitors are to, you know, kind of back up the credit here a little bit, but enough of them said that they didn't want people to know the attack weight range of their Frostlass that I felt it'd probably be best not to say any names of who I talked to. So people at home can't play guess who with who would have told me versus who didn't tell me and all that kind of stuff. I'm just going to close the door on all that, right? Because like when it came to Dunebug and Rise, when I talked to them about Obstagoon, they said that I could share what range their stats were in, that they fit the range or not, but they didn't want me sharing the precise IVs that they used. And um, it's the same kind of idea, but a little bit scarier for Frostlass because Frostlass is more concerned about the CMP side of things, where Obstagoon is a little bit more footloose, right? So I definitely understand where they're coming from when it comes to that kind of concern. Even even beyond the play Pokemon tournaments, there's also still factions where you know who your specific opponent is like a week ahead and you can change which Pokemon you're using, not the species, but the IVs. If I'm getting this wrong, I don't know a whole lot about factions, but from what I understand, you can swap out different Pokemon, right? As long as it's the same species. And so if you know that, you know, Jimmy Taylor is using this attack weight on his Frostlass, or at least falls into Swag's range from that video, well, then, you know, you just have to be a little bit ahead of that to get an advantage on him. So it, it makes sense to me. If you need any doubts cleared, though, I know that Tho Tactical used an attack weighted Frostlass that fits into this range. I can't find the screenshot, but I know he shared his IVs publicly at one point. Um, but I couldn't find them again. Like two months ago when I was going to make this video in like a week, I figured I could find like the VOD or whatever where he showed them off and then just screenshot it then. But we all know how that went, you know, two months later here. From what I recall, I think it was the 215.15 because I remember making the mental note that it was a slightly worse version than the rank five. So that sounds about right, but I don't have the hard evidence. So I could just be making some shit up. At the end of the day, who really knows what IVs? All these competitors could be lying to me just to mess with their opponents because Ryan Swag said they shared it with them. It doesn't mean that it's the reality. You know, Rise and Dunebug, they could have been using the rank one Obstagoon the whole damn time. 
and we'd be none the wiser. But at the end of the day, I hope you guys, you know, trust my integrity and I trust the integrity of the people I talk to. So it it looks right on paper, <laughs> you know, and I mean, at the end of the day, we're looking at the rank eight frost last instead of the rank one. So how worse could it be than the rank one? Right. But uh, yeah. At any rate, that's all I gotta say about Frostlass right now. If you got any questions on this content, of course, comment below. Let me know what's up, and I'll be happy to help you out. And if you enjoyed this kind of content, you want to see more like it, maybe you want to know all the different IVs you might want to know for the upcoming Slowpoke Community Day. Well, make sure to subscribe to Swag Tips. Swag Tips. I'd also like to give a special shout out to these patron supporters. If you want to support Swagman on Patreon, link in the description. Behold, mortals. The one true founder.